Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Ngozi. Uh, welcome all to the Global Supply Chain Forum that we're organizing today. We just have had with the DG uh, some discussions with uh, leaders of the, of the sectors. And I'd just like to introduce Dr. Uh, Ngozi Okonjo uh, Iweala, Director General of the WTO, for opening remarks for our event, um, which will be followed by two uh, sessions. Uh, Dr. Ngozi, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jean-Marie, and uh, welcome everyone to our first Global Supply Chain uh, Forum. Thank you for joining us today. Um, even before the war in Ukraine, which has the, is at the top of our minds, supply chain disruptions were weighing on global trade, economic growth, and price stability. We convened this meeting to explore what practical solutions the WTO, both members and the Secretariat can bring to the table to help solve these issues as we've done over the past year for trade in COVID-19 vaccines and inputs. I thank our stellar lineup of speakers for making the time to share ideas with us. And I thank my wonderful WTO colleagues for organizing the event today. We just finished a fantastic meeting with CEOs and other leaders from every part of the supply chain. Everyone is willing to cooperate to find solutions. And hopefully we will come back with uh, takeaways from all of this event uh, uh, today to see how the WTO can help to make things work better. Um, back in November, we held an information session to look at um, congested ports, shipping log jams, rising freight rates, and other supply chain challenges that had emerged in the wake of the supply and demand shocks arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. It became clear that many problems we were grappling with then and now are the result of more goods moving across borders than ever before. It's worth taking a moment to remember that the issues we are working to solve are problems born of success. Without effective government policies to sustain demand and keep markets broadly open, without nimble adaptation by businesses as consumers shifted from services to durable goods, and without the heroic efforts of seafarers, truck drivers, longshore and warehouse workers, pilots and others to keep goods moving, the pandemic could easily have led to a prolonged collapse in growth and trade. But that is of little comfort to everyone on the wrong end of supply chain disruptions and high shipping costs, which are proving more stubbornly persistent than many of us had expected. Micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises have been hit particularly hard, given their narrow margins and more limited financial resources. Poor countries, small and vulnerable economies, and landlocked developing countries risk being pushed out of global value chains or finding it even harder to break into them. Pandemic-related supply chain disruptions are weighing heavily on LDCs and LLDCs. The pandemic continues to threaten further supply shocks, and the unfolding tragedy in Ukraine is adding to supply chain woes. While its full implications for global supply networks will take time to become clear, we have seen immediate impacts on global food security with sharp price increases for grains, oil seeds, and vegetable oils and fertilizer, as well as energy. We are monitoring developments closely with our partners. Over the next two hours, we are going to hear from an exciting range of voices, ocean carriers, port operators, logistics companies, government representatives, and businesses of all sizes. We will hear about how they have experienced the supply chain disruptions, and how they have responded. And we will hear their, their ideas for how we can build more resilient and inclusive supply chains in the future. Much like the WTO itself, our supply chain infrastructure needs to remain fit for purpose. Because even though the supply chain network expanded in size and efficiency to enable a huge increase in global trade, the volume of merchandise exports was 3.7 times higher almost four times higher in 2019 than in 1990. It was not built for a world where a climate disaster can interrupt factory operations worldwide, or a microscopic virus can upend the movement of goods, services, and people almost overnight. 
This is no case to a retreat from trade. I just want to emphasize that because trade helps us adapt to these and other shocks. Deeper, more diversified international markets remain our best bet for supply resilience. It is clear that equipping our supply chain infrastructure to cope better with sudden changes demands action and investment, both public and private. But the question I want to put to you is what more we can do? What more can we do to address supply chain choke points by fostering diversification? Bringing more countries into international production networks, what I would like to call re-globalization, would be a win for supply resilience and for development. The WTO offers a unique forum for global dialogue on supply chain issues. Through our monitoring function, we helped identify bottlenecks and reduce export restrictions affecting the production and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. Enhancing trade facilitation can accelerate throughput at borders. Liberalizing trade in transport and logistics services is a third tool to bolster supply chain infrastructure. I always say that the global trading system of the 21st century needs to deliver for people everywhere. Making supply chains work better is part of that. That's why the ideas we're exchanging today are so important. And I can't wait to listen to them. Thank you. I think now we, we, we can proceed to, to the fireside chat from large and small businesses. Jean-Marie, I hand over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, hope you can hear me. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ngozi, for opening uh, your opening remarks uh, of this Global Supply Chains Forum. And welcome everyone joining us uh, today. My name is Hebe Kanziel. I am the Senior Media Initiatives Manager at Thomson Reuters Foundation, which is the corporate foundation of Thomson Reuters. Um, we too, Thomson Reuters Foundation, we've been working to help build back better, more resilient uh, economies after the pandemic. And we do this by building free, fair and informed societies and by working with the media and developing them so that they can become trusted partners uh, to tackle any development issue. Um, I would like to start with a short poll just to gauge uh, and get some insights from our audience members here. So if we can have a small, uh, the poll questions uh, aired uh, shortly. Here we go. So, um, which aspect of the supply chain disruptions is causing you and your partners the most pain? And we have a couple of options here. So high transportation costs, lost disrupted transportation routes, transportation congestion, difficulty accessing critical inputs, labor skills shortages, access to digital technology, and availability of affordable trade finance. <clears throat> you can go and vote, and we shall shortly see the, the answers. Give us a couple of um, seconds. All right, so the results are in. And it seems that 41% of those who voted cited the high transportation costs, which I guess is not, um, is not surprising, uh, given what Dr. Ngozi was uh, sharing with us just right now. And after that, again, delay, uh, related to transportation is transportation congestion and delays as a result, I, I would imagine, of the blockages. Uh, followed by difficulty accessing critical inputs. And at the very bottom, we have a tie between access to digital technology and availability of affordable trade finance. So um, 
that seems to be hitting hitting home to so many of you audience members. Fortunately, we have, um, we're gonna start with a fireside chat with some experts who can comment um, and who will give us insights from their perspectives, the, their partners and their companies and stakeholders on the ground to see if, if, they're, if they're sharing that as well, those pains. So allow me to uh, introduce our uh, panel. We have with us uh, Peter Baker, President and CEO of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It is a CEO-led community of the world's leading sustainable businesses, working on solutions needed to produce net zero, nature positive, and an equitable future. Hello, Peter. And then we have we also have Pamela Co. Hamilton, Executive Director of the International Trade Center which is a joint agency of the World Trade Organization and the United Nations, focusing on expanding trade opportunities uh, to foster sustainable development. Uh, hi, Peter. Hi, uh, Pamela. And finally, last but not least, we've got John Denton, Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce, the World Business Organization enabling business to uh, secure peace, prosperity, and opportunity. And again, we share a common ground with all of us. Um, uh, let's start with Peter. And so, Peter, you've seen the results of uh, the audience members chiming in on some of the pain points, citing high transportation costs as um, one of the biggest uh, choke points that they've, uh, they've experienced. From your perspective, your network has over 200 uh, companies across various uh, uh, sectors. How have the uh, blockages impacted them? Uh, impacted their sustainability and decarbonization efforts, again, to produce an equitable future. Peter? Great. Uh, thank you, Eva. Hope you can hear me well. Yes. Let, me, uh, let me start by thanking WTO and, of course, Dr. Ngozi for bringing this uh, global supply chain forum together. More than ever, I think this is uh, what we need to put central in our discussions. Uh, Well-functioning supply chains are crucial to global prosperity, Challenges like we've seen with the pandemic, the climate emergency, and obviously today's uncertain times put them under enormous strain. Indeed, you know, as you mentioned, WBCSD, more than 200 companies working together to accelerate towards a net zero, nature positive, and equitable future. And making supply chains more resilient and sustainable is on the mind of all these companies. This is instrumental in ensuring successful business operation and supply chain blockages, whether they're physical due to extreme weather or geopolitical, such as we currently see, do have significant impact. Uh, our, our companies, the companies we work with, have all set significant sustainability and decarbonization targets. And for these, they need to be able to operate efficiently with limited uncertainty in a stable and rule-based environment. From that point of view, the work of WTO that helps to create that rule-based approach to trade is an imperative for these companies to operate successfully. At WBCSD, we've leaned into work around supply chains for a long term, focusing on value chains in particular, to create a more holistic representation of their importance. Recently, we launched the Carbon Transparency Pathfinder which will enable wide-scale exchange of primary carbon emissions data for scope three accounting. Uh, we've done work on Vision 2050, in which we laid out the key transitions that value chains in the world will need to go through. And obviously with the unfolding events in the Ukraine, we have now started work with the UN Global Crisis Response Group to map and mitigate supply chains disruptions as a result of the war and the subsequent sanctions. But equally important, I would say, we are co-leading work in partnership with the Stockholm Plus 50 Secretariat and the Stockholm Environmental Institute. Key work on value chains to help drive a synthesis report with action recommendations on how to improve global supply chains to become more sustainable and part of a road to net zero nature positive and equitable world. 
Stockholm Plus 50 will be a major UN meeting focusing on a healthy planet for the prosperity of all, happening on June 2nd and 3rd in Sweden. It commemorates the 1972 UN Conference on the Environment and celebrates 50 years of global environmental action. As part of this work, we've launched a public survey asking around key urgent and important issues that affect supply chains right now, similar to the little poll you just did. Um, even though uh, preliminary, I have some initial results. Decarbonization remains the most urgent and important issue to solve. Second issue consistently cited following decarbonization is circularity. Other key challenges on top of mind are sustainable sourcing, disclosure, and transparency. Uh, key levers to change is policy and governance is number one. And of course, financial investment and public-private partnerships secondly. So I welcome all of you on the line to also take the survey and join us and update it, of course, with current affairs and how they will impact supply chains globally. Companies depend on diverse value chains, have a key role in making them more sustainable. And I want to thank again WTO for bringing us together on this important discussion. The world needs it. We need a multilateral system that works. And I hope this uh, afternoon can contribute to that. So thank you. And back to you, Adam. Mute. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> two years ago, two years running. Thank you so much, Peter. Multi-stakeholder, multilateral approach. I would like to move on to Pamela. We've Pamela, we've heard from Peter about um, the effects of the uh, global uh, supply chain blockages on their member uh, their member organizations, as well as efforts to decarbonize. To you, I turn with another question, again, looking at global trade disruptions, but this time, how are they impacting SMEs and their competitiveness, especially in the developing world, right? Um, have some fared better than others? And what are, the, what, are their, what are the lessons there for, so we can extend? Um, thank Thanks, Heba. Can you hear me properly? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. I've been having some issues hearing. So um, it's really great to take part in this panel. Um, I'm dialing in from Guatemala today, visiting some of our ITC projects at the border with El Salvador. So the issue of global trade disruptions and the impact on development is really all around me. So let me go directly to your question since we're also on a timer. <laughs> I think there's no gain saying that the impact of the pandemic has been devastating for most businesses and even more so for MSMEs who by their very size are more vulnerable to external shocks. Mm -hmm. ITC's research has found that over 60% of micro and 57% of small businesses were negatively affected by COVID-19 shutdowns. Let me quickly outline a few of the major repercussions from the global trade disruptions. Firstly, MSMEs have been affected by a vast reduction in the availability of inputs. Secondly, a precipitous decline in the demand for their outputs. Thirdly, export barriers that block access to markets. And fourthly, logistics service disruptions. In fact, almost 50% of trade MSMEs struggled with reduced logistics services during the pandemic. It has been a devastating two years for small businesses, especially in developing countries. So current events suggest we have an even more difficult few years ahead, but we are hopeful. Still, and this goes to your second question, that despite the bleak picture, there's a ray of hope. We found that many MSMEs, despite all these challenges, showed a high degree of resilience and agility in the face of these challenges. So it's worth asking why? What do these resilient small firms have in common? Something that came out clearly through our research and also our experience in the field is that fundamentals matter. And they matter not only during good times, but especially in bad times. Those businesses that displayed certain competitiveness characteristics before COVID hit were more resilient during the crisis and able to bounce back faster. So what are these fundamentals that have enabled some to thrive while others have disappeared? I would put them in three categories. Compete, connect, change. 
In the first category, we found that those MSMEs that were able to survive had certain key business fundamentals in place. These included, first, good inventory management. Secondly, full record keeping. Thirdly, a business bank account, a diverse network of suppliers, and finally, employees with the right set of skills. I know it seems obvious, but sometimes it's the obvious things that make the difference between surviving, thriving, or closing up shop. So let me illustrate some of these points. On good inventory management, only one third of enterprises with poor inventory management practices showed high levels of resilience during the crisis, compared to about half of the firms with highly efficient inventory management. On the issue of diversity of suppliers, we found that firms dependent on one supplier were considerably more likely to anticipate shutting down within a few months than those with a more diversified base of suppliers. And thirdly, on the access to skills, we know that having a skilled staff increases MSME's technical efficiency and their ability to respond to changing circumstances. So as you can see, these are not incredibly complex issues, but basic good practices that are often still lacking in many of our small businesses. The second category is connect. Our research has shown that there are elements of competitiveness that can actually make a firm less resilient. Lean inventories and streamlined input sourcing can lower costs, but leave the firm vulnerable to supply disruptions. Being more efficient and producing more can make you more competitive, but at the same time, it can come at the expense of the flexibility and diversity of relationships required for resilience. So the best strategy for resource strapped medicine my core advice would be to focus on building both competitiveness and resilience. How? By staying connected, participating in global value chains. It may seem counterintuitive given recent events, but integrating more closely into value chains while making a firm more exposed to disruptions also gives businesses more tools to weather crises. This is because importing and exporting help companies build relationships that are useful during crises. Time and time again, the data bears out this fact. Companies that export and or import are also more likely to have positive constructive responses to the pandemic than firms that operate domestically. They were likely to go online, make new products and source from new suppliers. Connectedness also includes engagement with BSOs and developing an online presence in the digital marketplace. Those companies able to evolve quickly into digital offerings were more competitive and able to withstand the shocks. Finally, the third category, change. MSMEs that were able to innovate and incorporate changes and showed a high degree of agility were also more successful in weathering the storm. In fact, some even increased sales and utilized opportunities for marketing through online virtual trade shows. One real world example is a Kenyan company, Siafu that was producing homeware from handcrafted natural materials. The lockdown came, they had to source alternatives such as cotton, grass, bone, and leather, thereby diversifying their input sourcing and creating greater resilience for the long term. Investing in R&D, human capital, as well as new technologies will also be important. Let me conclude by em emphasizing these points. There are three fundamental actions that can help small businesses become more resilient. First, become more competitive by investing in basic yet critical business fundamentals. Second, stay connected through participating in value chains and the digital economy. And thirdly, change. Be willing to step outside of your comfort zone, embrace new innovations beyond the cutting edge. It sounds straightforward, but it almost never is. And that's why it's so important to have partners like the ITC, WTO, ICC, and WBSC to help us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pamela. And again, compete, connect, and change. Um, the time is tight, and I know the, all the information is very still interesting. Uh, I would like to finally hear from John Denton. Uh, tell us about the experience of your members uh, with uh, trade disruption and supply chain blockages, uh, as well as some of the innovation, some of the, like Pamela was saying, the resilience, or again, in times of crises, we innovate. And that's something very interesting from, from our perspective as well. 
Uh, look, thanks so much, Hiba, and it's great to be with you, and congratulations, Ngozi, putting together what I think is a very important discussion. It's actually something useful that the WTO is doing, and uh, I'm, pl I'm pleased to see it. But as you said in your opening comments, and I don't think we can ignore the context we're operating in, in the, with the current crisis and the uh, unjustified and unlawful law war taking place in Ukraine, the consequences of that have flowed extremely quickly. I and mean, one of the things the ICC does was sort of uh, the, just the nature and the scale of where we are and the real-time data we have is we're able to assess extremely quickly. In fact, within the first three days of the invasion, we were able to gather together some very important information on the impact of sanctions on the imports and exports of over 120 countries. And what, it's, what, what it showed was very much the unintended consequence of that has affected supply chains and value chains in developing and emerging economies in a way in which was never intended. A point I'm making, and I have written to Malpass at the World Bank, to Kristalina at the IMF, I met with uh, Mari Pangetsu last week in Washington, D.C., is that there's an immediate crisis that's occurring in value chains. Did anyone seriously intend for banana makers in villages in Ecuador to be affected? That's actually what happened when you actually look at the real-time impact on the export of bananas, which had an important market in Russia. Uh, none of us are arguing with the need for sanctions or the sanctions approach. What I'm saying is if you want global solidarity, you also need to look at the supply chain impacts and do something about it. And that includes the World Bank, the IMF, the regional development banks that I've also approached directly, making available some structural adjustment packets, packages. And seriously, it's looking at some lines of credit here. They've got to move faster here. We're seeing the same thing impact tea exports from Sri Lanka. And actually, who would have thought the way in which urea was going to be disrupted and the consequences that's already being felt in Brazil? This is all going on. It's really important to have the real time impact. But in this context, as I said before, if you want global solidarity, you need to ensure that the economic, economic incentives are there, not disincentives to allowing countries to actually support that. Actually, we would all know that more than 25, almost 25% of countries abstain from the United Nations vote as well. So just draw that to your attention. And of course, what I'm really pointing to here is the disproportionate impact which has occurred on SMEs, micro SMEs, particularly in developing and emerging economies. I'm so glad to see Pamela and what you're doing in Guatemala. I was in Ecuador about 10 days ago. I've actually just come back from Colombia as well, where you're seeing similar sort of issues and are actually around the borders, in particular, moving goods across borders all the time. So uh, I really think we should focus on, on, on immediate uh, uh, immediate support for these important economies, but in particular, these desperate people in SMEs and micro SMEs who are actually being hurt. Let's see what we can do there. And we've come up with some practical solutions. Look, I'm not a tale of gloom. I'm actually in business, so I'm eternally an optimist. And as you say, Heba, when you look at crisis, it does create innovation. There's no doubt about it. We've seen companies, as Pamela has noted and as Pete has noted, looking very carefully at their strategies, the competitiveness. We're looking at new, new attempts at vertical integration, using digital, etc. What struck me, though, by your survey up front is the low impact that was felt by people in terms of absence of digitization and actually trade finance. Frankly, that flies in the face of the reality. If you look at the two issues that must be actually addressed, and this actually almost gives the ability for policymakers to ignore acting on these things, it's around digitization. If you want resilience, you've got to ensure access to digital skills, but also digital platform. That also means you've got to make some bold reforms in terms of the digital economy. Why not for a start? make digital documentation, which imply, which actually allow for negotiable instruments, basically bills of lading to be digitized and have the same force at law. That's something practical governments can do. The G7's calling it, but even the G7 leader, the UK, which actually called for it, is actually lagging on this and moving on a go slow basis. That's not a way to lead. You've actually got to lift the game on digitization. The other on trade finance, it's absolutely crazy. We've got a $1.8 trillion gap in trade finance. The fact of the matter is there's a policy failure at global level that does not recognize the need for speedy and low and accessible access to trade finance at a reasonable cost. There's a series of reforms that need to be brought in, which we've actually articulated very clearly. We've taken it to the G7, I'm taking it to the G20, but part of that is actually acting now. I mean, the ICC, for example, we're now creating our own trade finance tools because we've given up waiting for others to do it. There's a market failure there. So I think there are two areas where bold policy reforms are required and let's get on with it. 
Thanks so much, uh, everyone. Um, thanks so much, John, and uh, all our uh, speakers. And yes, unpacking solutions and digitization is just one. Um, very interesting panel. Uh, next up, unlocking solutions to build resilient and inclusive supply chains. So hopefully those ideas and suggestions will be will pan out even uh, more there. Um, again, thank you to, for uh, our speakers, Peter Baker, Pamela Co. Hamilton, and John Denson. And please stay on. Uh, audience, please keep your questions uh, coming through the Q&A. And I will hand over to the WTO colleagues. Thank you very much. Well, hello, um, I'm Alan Beatty. I'm the Senior Trade Writer at the Financial Times in Brussels. Um, and I'm going to be chairing this, um, the first of the two panels, which is on supply chain disruptions, impacts and responses. Um, we've got panelists from, from a range of, of uh, companies and indeed the public sector working on supply chain issues. So we should get to a, a variety of perspectives. Um, <clears throat> uh, to begin with, we have Bud Dar, who's the um, Executive Vice President for Maritime Policy. Uh, and Government Affairs at the MSC uh, Group. We have Clemens Cheng, Managing Director for Hutchison Ports for Europe. Um, C.D. Kaita, who's the Minister of Trade, Industry, Regional Integration and Employment for the Gambia. Rubana Hook um, from Mohammadi Group in uh, Bangladesh. Victoria Claveri, Head of Trade for Standard Chartered. Um, and to sum everything up, Kim Chet Long, who is the incoming <coughs> Chair of the WTO Council for Trade and Services. Now, um, because we are running uh, already somewhat behind time. Uh, I'm going to be as strict as I can on timing and ask all the, uh, the panelists to keep their responses to four minutes. There is, of course, a timer on your screen that you can see, um, which I hope you can keep to. We're going to have two rounds of questions um, and then hopefully some Q&A from the audience um, if we have time. <clears throat> if I can turn to, to Bud Dar to begin with. Um, we've seen a succession of shocks to supply chains the last few years. COVID, obviously, but also energy prices, now possibly food prices. Is this going to have a permanent effect on the shipping industry and a permanent effect on supply chains? I, I think it will have somewhat of a permanent effect, although these are really acute circumstances, which were uh, really difficult to foresee, particularly with the pandemic, because I think we all were prepared to really be going into a deep global recession. Uh, which really never happened. And in fact, kind of the opposite happened with demand for uh, hard consumer goods uh, as opposed to uh, money that people were probably spending on services and uh, discretionary things uh, that, that were not hard goods uh, prior to the pandemic. So uh, we've learned a lot and, and these have been a series of shocks and we may not be done yet. I mean, I, I, I can't say what the ultimate impact on, on the oil markets may be. And of course, energy is a substantial component of our operating costs, and that gets ultimately reflected in the marketplace, uh, as well as, um, you know, what what will the overall global economic effects be of a protracted conflict in, in, in Ukraine and, and the sanctions that may go with that, uh, or just general nervous, nervousness in the equity markets? I, mean, I can't, can't say for sure. But what I can say for sure is this has gotten everyone's attention at just how susceptible supply chains may have been to things such as lack of diversification and also the need for investments, um, not only today but and tomorrow, but yesterday in a lot of the shoreside infrastructure. If you look at what you know, made great imagery, and it was on the news all the time, continues to be to some degree of long queues of container ships at anchor, where typically in our business, you, know, you don't expect to have any container ships at anchor. We had a lot of ships at anchor, and we still have pretty long queues at some of the major ports. Um, that's a symptom. It's not the problem. We as ship operators didn't suddenly forget how to operate ships. We remain very, very good at that. We remain standing by and ready to connect the world, which is our core function. But 
uh, it really was a reflection of the inability of the shore side element, uh, really from the key side all the way into the retail outlet uh, to deal with these massive surges in volume, largely driven by uh, consumer demand, as I mentioned. So I think you will see some diversification of supply chains occur that didn't occur before. Some people have said, you know, you stand by for more nearshoring or reshoring of activities. I don't know, but that's a lot easier said than done. But I do know for sure that we are looking at alternative uh, ports and alternative uh, ways to connect our, our, our customers because one way or another, um, they need our services. Um, other things that we've learned is that in order to have sufficient surge capacity to really be resilient enough to deal with such a massive mood swing in volumes as we saw here, you need a level of excess capacity that honestly our industry is not able to provide. And I think many other actors in the global supply chains aren't able to provide. We've gotten so efficient. And in our case, in large part, it had been because the margins were so thin and there were plenty of years where there was no profitability in the container sector that they couldn't carry the excess capacity. So we were okay at dealing with you know, reasonably predictable modulations in supply and matching it up with demand. But these sorts of swings where we saw a 20% drop below the, the baseline and then a 30% increase above the baseline all in you know half of a calendar year is just not something that there was enough capacity either for us or for, for other actors, whether it was rail or truck or warehousing to deal with. So I think it's a real eye opener that it comes at a cost. There's a balance to be had there, but it's also not so simple. I mean, we have added a hundred ships to our network. We have added all the capacity we possibly can, but just adding more ships to a queue may just make the queue longer if the shore side components are not actually in a position to increase the throughput with the kind of velocity we need with containers to allow both the customers to get what they need and also the markets to, to normalize a bit more. Okay, Thank you. that's really interesting. So let me turn to Clements on this particular issue. I think everyone knows or everyone thinks they know a lot more about ports than they did 12 months ago or two years ago because there's been much, much more focus on it. Um, just to begin with, can you just give us, give us a sort of an overview and say which countries, which regions have seen the biggest congestion and, and how have the ports themselves responded? And I'm sorry, was that a follow-up for me directly? Sorry, that's for that's for Clements. That's a question to, to yeah, move on to the question about ports is is you know where have you seen the biggest congestion and how do you think you've responded? How have ports responded to that? Great, thank you very much, uh, Alan. Well, f first of all, thank you, Director General, and also to WTO for organizing this event and for inviting me to uh, participate. Um, let me start by maybe sharing some of the structural issues with you first. I think for many years, thanks to containerization, the global supply chain has been working well, cargo moving smoothly around the world in a just-in-time fashion. So this um, global supply chain has been well balanced for a long period of time. And the cost of transportation was relatively inexpensive. And to continue the drive for efficiency, I think our shipping lines colleagues have started to build very, very big ships in order to get economy of scale. Uh, these big ships, although can be ordered and delivered in a couple of years, but the land size supply chain and the infrastructure to support it, including ports, takes years to develop, and particularly in Western uh, countries where environmental issues are of primary concern. And just to give you an example, I think um, when with the deployment of these big ships, the number of port cores reduces because you don't have the ports to actually be able to handle them. The core sizes increase. And one of our ports recently has actually handled a ship with a total exchange of containers more than 27,000. If you line them up one after the other, it will be something like 160 kilometers long. So roughly the distance from Brussels to Rotterdam. So if you imagine having that number of boxes being dumped in your yard by one single voyage, uh, how, how, how can the hinterland support sort of clear it quickly? So that is one of the major issues which um, the port operators are grappling with. And we entered a perfect storm during the pandemic 
where there's a high demand cargoes, including a lot of PPE um, uh, equipment um, in the West. And that's also coincide in the shutdown of factories in the East. So it created congestions and a spike of uh, cargo demand. And this also coincide with shutdown uh, of um, some of the ports and also logistic workers as well as port workers self-isolating, further squeezing land side capacity. Now, coming to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the um, land side distributions, I think the retailers also filled up their warehouses, uh, sometimes wrong stocks, therefore cannot actually be able to clear that congestions quickly to take in more boxes. The disruptions to the global shipping schedule was uh, phenomenal. In 2021, vessel reliabilities was around 30% globally. And with the ongoing pandemics, we continue to face complexity in managing our operations in various parts of the world. It started with the factory shutdown in China first, and then the West also faced that. And currently, I think East Coast of America is well reported to suffer a lot of congestions, and Northern Europe as well. But more recently, we see that in China, there's some uh, built up uh, in some ports, some ships, um, queuing in some ports and because of um, COVID shutdown. So in other words, congestions are everywhere and it's at different times. So turning to how do we deal with these challenges? And we have actually observed that some of our terminals that's uh, deploying uh, much more automations as well as uh, AI technologies have actually coped much better I mean, our port in Barcelona has actually done extremely well and given consistent high productivity throughout the last two years. So some of the solutions I would suggest is concentrate on technology, um, build the right infrastructure, embrace automation. I think that's an important part because uh, people are generally worry about automations, whether that's going to destroy their job or not. But we need to actually educate our employees differently in that. Build sustainability and also trying to remove bureaucracy. And finally, is to collaborate more. Uh, I think the WTO conference here allow us to share our views. Certainly that, that will actually help uh, moving and trying to solve the global supply chain challenges. Thank you. That's great. Well, I shall come back. Thanks so much. I'll come back to you later and ask about specifically what the WTO and, uh, and governments can do. <clears throat> At this point, let me um, move on to, uh, to someone who has to deal with this from a government point of view, uh, Minister Keita from um, Gambia, um, a small country, short coastline, you know, heavily affected by trade disruptions. Um, how, have you, how have you had to deal with the disruptions you've, you've, you've encountered by land and sea um, as a result of COVID and as a result of all the other shocks that we've seen? Thank you very much, Alan, and the WTO leadership for arranging this important forum. And as you have introduced, the Gambia, like many developing countries, is a net importer of food, uh, particularly. And the disruption of the supply chain emanating from the pandemic has adversely affected the country. The Gambia rely on imports for most of the food, particularly the basic essential commodities, to meet the domestic demand. As a result, uh, in 2020, the Gambia was immediately affected by measures taken at the global level to curb the spread of the COVID. Uh, the, at the global level, we observed that the pandemic has seriously disrupted the supply chain, resulting in increased freight costs and prices. For example, the freight cost to the port of Banjul has jumped on an average from $2,800 per 20-foot container before the pandemic in 2019 to $7,000 per 20-foot container during the first months of 2022, an increase of 150%. The international commodity prices, such as rice, sugar, vegetable oil, which are the main imports to the Gambia, has also increased by an average of at least 30% between the first quarter of 2020 and 2022. At the domestic level, the measures taken by the government to contain the virus has disrupted the supply of goods, especially the essential commodities. 
in mid 2020, the government introduced emergency measures to control the spread of the pandemic that affected the flow of essential commodities. All the, these measures culminated in an increase in the price of goods, especially the essential commodities in the domestic market by in certain instances up to 40%. To contain and mitigate the impact of the disruption in the supply chain on the prices of goods at the domestic market, the government adopted a number of measures. One, the government introduced food aid program to support the vulnerable communities to access basic supply, food supplies to support their livelihood. The government also in, in collaboration with development partners, strengthened the market linkages connecting farmers, particularly women to buyers, this to enable them to sell their produce. And the ministry also organized a number of consultative meetings with importers and major retailers to provide more information available stock prices of essential commodities to minimize tendencies of taking advantage over during the pandemic. Uh, the ministry also in consultation with trade support institution implemented a, a price transparency mechanism where periodically we publish the price of essential goods to ensure that uh, the market information asymmetry is not taken advantage over by the uh, major traders. The government maintained a flexible tax payment plan for the business community, uh, allowing them more time to pay for their taxes. And the ministry also engaged the Gambia Ports Authority to come up with measures to, to decongest the ports to ensure fast clearing time to minimize the handling costs. And some of the SMEs were provided with support to enhance them to build their resilience. These were the measures taken by the ministry and the government to react to the price and other supply chain disruptions emanating from the uh, COVID. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, so let me move to um, another developing country, Bangladesh, um, heavily dependent, of course, on garments and textile exports. Um, and ask Ubana Hop from Bangladesh, the disruptions that you've seen to your export markets over the last um, few years, are they likely to have a permanent impact? Is the Bangladeshi export sector going to be permanently different, permanently smaller, have to find different markets than it was before the pandemic? Thank you for the question. Um, well, as far as Bangladesh is concerned, we've been so resilient to shocks. So when pandemic started in the initial month, we had a $3.18 billion worth of cancellation, 90% of which were reversed. And then our payment uh, terms were revised. So when we were supposed to be paid today, uh, we eventually uh, agreed in being paid after almost a year in many cases and with discounts. So Bangladesh is pretty used to external shocks, including price pressure. So you see, um, I mean, in, in the last couple of years, in the last four years, prices from uh, European Union has dipped by 4.35%. Um, yes, our, our capacities have increased. We continue uh, expanding our capacity and not optimizing them because there's always a capacity pressure from the brands in the West. But uh, the, the pressure from our side hasn't really gone up. So, you know, there's a, there's a discourse deficit uh, at our end. There is a trust deficit. And, and at the same time, there's a price deficit. So with so many deficits, Bangladesh still goes on and we're still expanding and we're almost, um, we've just had a 58% growth uh, in export in the last, um, in, in, on a year on year basis in, in the last month. But um, while, while, um, while the markets have changed, essentially what has changed is the consumer choices. Consumers have become more choosy. Uh, consumers have uh, all shifted to more or less online and more customized approaches. So right now we're also having to deal with smaller orders uh, perhaps more in quantity, but you know the size of orders have have reduced significantly. So instead of doing fifty thousand pieces per style, we're doing five hundred to thousand to five thousand. So automatically, you know the production lines are also very different. 
you know, we are, we are moving to more modular style of production and not making that much profit either. And of course, Bangladesh has not lost any market as such because our exports are still on the rise and the competing markets such as Cambodia just lost their GSP. Myanmar is, uh, of course, uh, has its own history. Um, so Vietnam is expensive. So as a result, Bangladesh still stands out in the export market. So in spite of the nearshoring that's being practiced uh, in the West, not much is, uh, is being lost here, except that value addition, of course, is not there. We're still doing basics. We are still exporting around uh, $5 billion worth of just T-shirts. So, you know, that focus has to change. Uh, diversification is, is stunted. So it's, it's not as if we're all diversifying into light engineering or anything else. Um, we are sticking to garments pretty, pretty obstinately. Um, but also, just to answer your question quickly, um, we have suffered from severe shocks because of COVID, especially with uh, payment. So what has happened is, um, you know, long, short-term financing was needed. Many of the brands declared bankruptcy and we got impacted. So at our end, we started getting into uh, creation of forced loan accounts by our central bank. As a result, many of us have been impacted. So I think it's, it's time to realize that Bangladesh does offer stability in terms of capacity to the West and Bangladesh does not bargain much and we give in to any prices that the buyer give us, buyers give us. And, uh, you know, we, we don't get to be in the, in the larger collaborative discourse that should be happening worldwide um, where we would be able to at least uh, uh, sort of place our demands and, and paint our landscape. Um, so that's not really happening. Okay, that's very interesting. I'll come back later to, to what, um, what help you might need from outside. But finally on the panel, Victoria Clavery from Standard Chartered. Um, obviously, every time there's a shock or there's a strain, trade finance is something that has to respond simply because the, the, the companies that trade are under, uh, under strain themselves. I mean, what have you seen from your clients' operations? How disruptive has it been? And has there been any positive aspect to this? Have people embraced digitization or any other more sophisticated supply chain finance as a result of, uh, of the pandemic? Thank you, Alan. Uh, yeah, supply chain disruptions have sparked a lot of discussions with our clients. Certainly, treasurers seem very much connected with their procurement and logistics teams, aligning supply chain strategies with financing strategies as they definitely need to go hand in hand. As many clients look to reconfigure their supply chains, the primary focus has been on resilience, agility, sustainability, and financial robustness across key members of the chain, whether suppliers or, or distributors. As this says goes, the chain is only as strong as the weakest link. Um, when it comes to financial requirements, we've seen a big spike in demand of supply chain finance programs with several motives, not just working capital optimization, but very much so ensuring that strategic suppliers have access to affordable financing, alleviating potential impact from increased, increased payment terms, I was just here from Rubana, and that these suppliers can fulfill purchase orders and, and stay afloat. As our clients also embark on their transition to net zero, we have also seen increased demand in provision of sustainability-linked supply chain finance programs, where our clients are trying to incentivize uh, good sustainable practices within their supply chain, whether it's water consumption or reduction of CO2 emissions, as an example. Um, your question was also about digitization. Supply chain disruptions have certainly encouraged an acceleration in digital transformation across the board, not only when it comes to achieving internal efficiency, centralization of specific functions, reduction of paper by way of invoicing, AI to uh, simulate specific disruption scenarios, or adoption of procure to pay platforms to enhance the end-to-end -end supply collaboration. <clears throat> It also, when it comes to connecting with their financing partners, um, clients have really embraced collaboration in many ways or digitization in many ways. 
leveraging APIs to connect with their banks sort of one-to-one, -one, but also looking at using multi-bank platforms to access financing, connecting once to that financing platform, and then allowing the banks to connect to those platforms to make the financing not only more efficient from an IT perspective for the buyers, but also um, much more widely available to suppliers and distributors on those platforms. And the third way thing that we've seen with our clients is they many of them have joined closed loop networks where all participants are in the supply chain are able to collaborate and uh, are bound by specific rule books. So that's something that we have seen as well um, increasing more and more. Back okay. to you, Anna. Thank you very much. Um, so let me go to the, the second round of questions now, going back to Bud, um, to Bud Dar. So you, you're talking before about where we might end up in the medium term, what changes there might be. But obviously, you know, week by week, in fact, day by day, the market is having to respond to the news coming out of Ukraine and the news coming, coming out of the commodity markets and so forth. Um, what's, your, what's your view of what's likely to happen in the very near future with the market? We have a, a ways to go before we see some normalization of the markets for the dynamics that, that got us here. And it's driven by supply and de demand. And keep in mind for most of the last 20 years, there's been an overcapacity sort of environment. So this is kind of a unfamiliar set of circumstances for both the shippers and us as the carriers to have a much less capacity than is actually needed in the marketplace. But a couple of things to watch for uh, would be as things start to loosen up ashore, then I think the additional capacity that has been added and continues to be add, added, we have a significant number of uh, new ships um, you know, that we continue to, to bring in, although you can't do that overnight and they're just now uh, starting to, to see that those capacity changes happen along with others. You look at the order book, you can read it. Uh, but the key will be if we don't free up the land side component of it, it will still not effectively have the kind of impact that we want it to because it will still appear as if there is less capacity than there really is if ships and containers are not fluid. So I think that's important. Uh, number two, obviously, we need to watch the, the macro picture around what a longer term sort of engagement or set of political circumstances around Russia and Ukraine mean for everyone in the global ecosystem, because this is all interconnected when you talk about supply chains and particularly containerized cargoes and those supply chains. Um, one of the earlier speakers did a, a really good job of describing how um, things you wouldn't anticipate happen downrange because it is so interconnected. And then one other thing that I will mention that we need to watch for is government intervention. And uh, it's always somewhat dangerous to try and regulate or legislate during the midst of a crisis for something that is really driven by underlying fundamentals. And I think we need to be very careful to make sure that unilateral actions in particular are not taken in a way that benefits some shippers over others, because that could be yet a further distor distortion and further disruption to the supply chain, as well as maybe bringing inefficiency into the system that doesn't exist right now, again, reducing the effective capacity that our customers actually see and can utilize. One last point that I want to make, it's slightly longer term, but it's other case, it's really right around the corner, 1 January 2023, and then 2023, when it comes to Europe, is decarbonization changes in the regulatory environment. We must decarbonize, and we've not forgotten that during the pandemic. We're continuing to work towards that every single day. And in our company, uh, we plan to be net zero for 2050. And if we can do it sooner, we're going to do it sooner. Um, but the regulatory landscape is shifting quite rapidly. And one of the things that may happen is there may be a need in general for ships, not just in the liner sector, to slow down worldwide. And as that happens, that may also have some impact on the resiliency of the market to equalize back to what is a otherwise natural supply and demand state because of that regulatory influence that is distorting what would otherwise be a market dynamic. And not that that's a bad thing, it probably needs to happen, but we need to be prepared for that and accept that's gonna have costs both in the shorter term and the longer term as we take this next step towards decarbonization, which is absolutely essential in my opinion. 
That's great. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Um, so turning back to Clemens, you were talking before um, about ports and how ports themselves are coping um, with the shocks. And I think you, you, you briefly mentioned what, what help might, might happen, what, what help might come from outside. If you had to name a few things, what could governments do and possibly what could the WTO organisations like the WTO help to, to unblock the bottlenecks that we're seeing at the ports? Sure. Thanks, Alan. I uh, forgot to unmilk myself there. Um, anyway, I uh, offer sort of uh, six broad categories. I think technology, um, infrastructure, automation, sustainability, um, bureaucracy, and uh, collaborations. And I think the to start off, maybe I can uh, ask. Um, I can actually share that many governments and international organizations have very little knowledge about how the global supply chain works. So as a starting point is to build up a knowledge bank that can be shared by all, and that will be a good thing. And so we can see where and anticipate a problems that may be coming up uh, in a particular location much earlier. And then, then perhaps we can have more engagement and consultation between the public sector and the private sector, just at least to listen to the challenges first. And by more engagement, I think, and building up the global picture together, we can take a more holistic approach to solving some of these more global challenges. Um, another ask um, would be to remove bureaucracy uh, between uh, trade borders. And we strongly support a standardized single trade window that's fit for all countries. So you have everyone working on a standard set of uh, trade documents. Uh, I think the ports and the customs uh, will also be uh, easy to facilitate uh, the trade flow, et cetera. So it reduce paperwork, bureaucracy, and waste. I think other areas for attention include um, investing in the right infrastructure, uh, which is more for the national governments, um, it's not just the port itself, but it's actually the hinterland supporting the ports um, with the right rail connectivity and the road network that's going to support the efficient movements of cargoes, both into the ports and outside the ports, are key. And the other part is to encourage standardization where it makes sense. However, we, we don't want to standardize everything and discourage innovations, obviously. I think standardization, when it makes sense, can actually ease a lot of bottlenecks and makes um, trade flow much faster. Developing uh, big data solutions and blockchains, uh, I think there are uh, a number of platforms out there and they are all designed to actually make trade more secure and also uh, improve the efficiency. And we welcome and actually talk to a number of these providers so it's not just a single blockchain provider that we're talking to. And ensuring a level playing field um, and efficient operations of markets. I think shipping and logistics are global business. If we have regionalization of regulations that will create inefficiency, I think earlier in the CEO uh, exchange, we touch on the point about carbon pricing. And I think certainly uh, that is a global issue and if there's no global um, uh, sort of regulations, uh, we, we may see uh, a distortions of an e efficient market. And I think finally is to provide leadership in getting industry players to discuss global issues and find common ground to solve global challenges, like technologies, uh, embracing automations, et cetera. Uh, as I said earlier on, I think the general workforce is a little bit uh, apprehensive about automations, worry about losing their job. But essentially, we had to educate them that we have to use technologies and automations like auto autonomous trucks. We're gradually rolling up in our terminals. And I think for the bigger supply chain, that will certainly ease some of the problems that we see in recent years. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, so let me turn back to Mr. Um, Cater. Obviously, <clears throat> as well as the WTO, and there are not many um, 
Uh, there are not many sort of broad agreements these days at the WTO, which are making a lot of difference. Um, however, there are regional agreements, such as the African Continental Free Trade Area, um, uh, and I gather the Maritime Organization for West and Central Africa, um, which, are, which are aiming to, to achieve integration on a regional level. Um, what are they doing? How useful are they? How, how might they help countries to sort of be buffers against future trade disruptions? And can they work alongside uh, WTO? Can you have regional and multilateral working alongside each other? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, as you have mentioned, the coming into force of the African Continental Free Trade Area started in January uh, 2021. But since then, the, the body is at its very formative stage. As such, it is to encourage trade between Africa, African countries and is complementing the role of the WTO in the sense that the WTO is at a global level while the AFCFTA's objective is to foster regional trade among the African countries to make Africa one market as, 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 a, as a continent. That is actually rolling out slowly. Uh, these services are still a subject of discussion while the agreement is going through different stages of ratification in a number of countries for goods and goods have actually, the agreement for goods have now been finalized. The one very important role that this African continental free trade area will usher in is the facilitation of a payment system. Currently, the African Exim Bank has supported the AFCFDA and they are working towards introducing a common payment platform whereby member countries can be able to pay using their local currencies. So these are all complementary to the role the WTO is playing. And we hope it will also increase the intra-African trade. Uh, the beauty about the FCFTA is working in any African country, the entire African market is at your disposal and it's making Africa almost literally a one-stop shop. You can operate from any of the member countries of AFCFTA. So we believe that this will usher in increased trade volume between African countries. And of course, the uh, non-trade barriers that exist are all subject of discussion as a result of this, uh, particularly trade across the borders. We believe uh, this will introduce enhanced trade volume between the African countries and also adding value because you don't have to incur large freight charges for goods that are available in other African countries if the AFCFTA kicks in as we expect. So in a nutshell, we can say that the regional trade agreement and the continent-wide trade agreement is complementary to the agreements of the WTO and is only above is only a support factor there too and not any other way. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. Um, so turning to uh, Rubana Hook, you were saying before that Bangladesh hasn't necessarily lost um, its export markets and it just it keeps on. Um, and as you also mentioned, Bangladesh has pretty good market access. Um, to the developed markets through preference schemes and so forth. <clears throat> on top of that, on top of the preference schemes, what could governments in those markets, governments anywhere, and organisations like the WTO do for countries like Bangladesh and, and, and their exports? Thank you. So the answer is simple. The, the rules of the game must change. Uh, there must be more stress on, of course, uh, on focusing on vulnerabilities of uh, developing nations like us. And also uh, there must be special focus on sustainability. Quite interestingly with COVID, uh, the ultimate vulnerability of our labor force was exposed. So Bangladesh pays around $423 million in wages every month. So automatically we don't have uh, the luxury of having uh, you know, extra funds uh, to be ready for external shocks to hit us. And you know, world's going to probably be 
facing uh, one uh, shock after the other, as it seems. So we must be ready for it. And who's going to make us ready or prepared to encounter these shocks, which also leave our labor sector, our, our, our workers exposed to extreme vulnerability. So vulnerability is one thing, financial vulnerability um, must be looked upon and also uh, sustainability. Bangladesh has the highest number of green uh, factories, 157, and uh, nobody talks about it. Uh, we have great green factories, we don't have any green prices. So uh, we, while we talk about automation and while we say that you know, labor will be threatened, that's also partly true because uh, one less pair of jeans will impact uh, at least a couple of workers here. So if you're not paying the right price, um, the, the talk about sustainability becomes almost um, literally an empty slogan because you know, it's, it's human lives as well. So if you could actually practice hashtag go human, go green, then it would matter. So rules of the games must change in terms of handling sustainability, handling vulnerabilities, and, and, a, and a much broader discourse must and should be negotiated by, initiated by uh, WTO so that we can all benefit from that. Thank you. Okay. I mean, there's been a lot of talk over the years about aid for trade and how aid is supposed to, to be made with, to cohere with trade, to, to mean that countries can, um, to cushion countries from shocks and also enable them to, to, um, uh, to compete more effectively. Do you think that means anything? Have you seen anything actually effectively come out of that? No, I mean, we, we don't, we are, we are pretty self-sufficient. We have never defaulted on any sovereign debts. So we are doing well. As a country, we have almost seven to eight percent GDP growth. It's not that. It's just that our our particular country is overly dependent on on ready-made garment export, and and it's it's basically without any value addition. So what we need is to have rules set so that the perception to source from Bangladesh changes. It is it, it is a country of great potential and resilience. We don't want any aid. But for sure, we want much more trading preferences so that we can actually graduate to the next platform because we have 4.1 million workers, so many mouth to feed. And, and if we don't have preferred engagement uh, from our developing, uh, developed partners, uh, we'll have a tough time. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, let me turn again to Victoria. Now, you were talking before about um, customers embracing uh, more sophisticated supply chain um, finance. And people have talked for a long time about how supply chain um, finance can help companies uh, with transparency in their supply chains to meet environmental social governance criteria in their supply chains. Why has it not happened so much until now? What is, what is it that's needed to kickstart it um, before the last couple of years? Thank you, Alan. So whilst digitization in trade finance has certainly increased in the past years, we're still a long way away from digitizing the trade flows end to end. Many digital solutions out there are only digitized just a, a little piece of the puzzle and we're not being able to, to put it all together as yet. Um, and there is no one size fits all solutions. There are probably two types of trade finance transactions that have progressed along sort of different paths. When you look at open account trade finance, such as receivables finance, supply chain finance, these are much, easy, much more easier to digitize as the parties sort of trust each other and banks are primarily taking credit in some cases, performance risk. Um, Information can be obtained fairly easily via the client's ERP or from procure to pay platforms where key parts of the supply chain can collaborate. And these are, we have very good examples of uh, putting together platform, uh, programs for clients, European and American retailers, helping them with supply chain finance <clears throat> programs and looking into how can we help in the sustainability of those supply chains, helping suppliers embrace um, sustainable practices and digital practices as well. On the other hand, we look at documentary trade transactions where banks step in not only to provide counterparty risk mitigation, 
but also credit risk, but very importantly also to provide controls of documents and uh, titles of documents. So for this piece, the digitization path has been much lower as it requires everyone in the chain to align to the standards. And that includes governments, boards, uh, legal systems and collaboration across all the actors, which is key. So we see many of our clients join these closed loop networks for documentary trade transactions where everybody's sort of bound by, by their own rule books and, and guidelines. So key to success and adoption of digital trade finance definitely is the development of standards, the interoperability of all these digital networks, standards for exchange of data and titles and storage, standards on how to store and transmit data and ensure that legal systems and ports are able to sort of support these digital flows. And that goes also very much into the ESG front where there are no globally accepted standards. So we definitely would welcome um, global standards for, for the sustainability front to ensure that not only companies are able to manage their supply chains, measure the, how they are transitioning towards decarbonization and net zero, but also the banking community able to finance these flows and avert sort of any risk of greenwashing afterwards. Great, thank you very much. Um, so what I'd like to do in the last few minutes um, is turn to Ambassador Long, Kamachet Long, who's, who's the incoming chair of, of um, uh, Services Council at the WTO, and say, what is it that you've heard that you found most interesting, most surprising, and what is it you think that the WTO can, can help with in the, in the years ahead? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. Uh, I, I think uh, we have heard... Uh, you know, we have listened to many interesting comments and a perspective from a good mix of uh, stakeholders here today, including uh, the logistic provider, port operator, uh, manufacturer, uh, also from the financial institution and from the government, which is, uh, like I said, it's very, uh, a good mix of people. So, I mean, this, this speaks volumes uh, to, the, to the kind of corporations that we would, we would need going forward. Uh, to address these uh, supply chain issues. Uh, many of our speakers have mentioned the needs for a collaborative approach, uh, utilizing the private, the public private sector uh, partnership and corporations to address the, uh, the issues, including uh, labor, labor issues also, I think, uh, to, to minimize uh, vulnerability. Uh, there are, I've learned that there are a number of factors impacting the supply chains. Uh, as highlighted by our speakers, uh, including sea and land transport congestion, uh, warehousing shortages, uh, trade financing. Uh, also, there is a supply and demand side constraint, lack of labor, etc. So these are all the the factors impacting the global supply chains. And then what what's interesting to learn is also COVID nineteen. I mean, it's although it's a big pandemic, it's not the only problem, you know, uh, uh, for global supply chain, but it does add to the many, many issues that are affecting global supply chains. Uh, and, and also what's interesting to learn is the changes in consumer behaviors that leads to the increased demand of uh, physical goods. But uh, in, in 2022, I think we have experience for more than two years now. I think we are in a better position to make a supply chain more resilient and uh, sustainable. Uh, in, on, on that, what's also interesting to learn is the land side uh, constraint and the port infrastructure uh, cannot handle the increased demand of container shipment and uh, the need for more investment to cut down the, the development time uh, of the port and the capacity and infrastructure, and also the, the benefit of tech, uh, digital technology to increase productivities. Uh, from the uh, exporter or manufacturer perspective, I think we learn a great deal that, that you know, this kind of, like the government industry, which is very labor intensive, is more sus susceptible to shock, uh, but uh, it is good to learn that uh, from the perspective of Bangladesh, I mean, they have been able to maintain resiliency and, and the profit margin. Uh, 
in terms of trade financing, I think what, what uh, came out from the discussion is on the need for increased need of trade financing, including uh, for working capital, but there's also uh, the linkages between trade financing, the digital adoption, and the, uh, uh, the linkage to sustainability elements. Uh, I think from the government perspective, uh, I, I think the role of government is very critical uh, in providing fiscal policies, uh, support to the private sector, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, of course, uh, a country can make use of regional, regional trade integration as a tool to uh, strengthen supply chains, and uh, which is complementary, as the minister from the Gambia has mentioned, complementary to WTO. But I think the, the multilateral trading systems is still a valuable tool, tool especially for the developing and uh, smaller and more vulnerable economies. Uh, so this leads to uh, my next part of the intervention as to what the WTO can do. Uh, allow me uh, to share my perspective uh, on trade in services. Uh, firstly, uh, let me start by noting that uh, while global supply chains has emerged and are being held together, uh, thanks to the transport and logistics services, it is uh, primarily uh, trade in these services that uh, underpin them. Uh, it is, in fact, not uh, always understood uh, that all the international transport and all transport and logistics services supplied by domestic, uh, dom uh, supplied domestically by foreign uh, operators is actually uh, trade in services. Uh, nonetheless, uh, trade in transport services over the past two COVID years has taken an odd turn, uh, like a V-shape, for example, like after the uh, initial sharp drop, it has uh, recovered uh, quickly and strongly, uh, rising by 45% year on year in the third quarter of 2021, and by 12% compared to the same period in 2019. Uh, the recovery uh, was boosted by soaring consumer demand, as we all know, and a formidable increasing in shipping rates. So transport services, uh, the trade in transport services play a significant role in, in the supply chain. And, and specifically as to what the WTO can do, uh, there might be three things that the, the WTO can do. Uh, first, the WTO can monitor uh, the economic and regulatory trend in the transport and logistics sectors, which also provide uh, a forum for members to discuss this trend and keep them under review. Uh, second, it offers a platform for any collaborative actions uh, members may wish to take uh, to help strengthen supply chains. Uh, areas for possible engagement could include embracing market openings in transport and logistic uh, services trade, uh, accelerating automation and digitalizations, or enhancing uh, trade facilitation. Uh, finally, uh, I think building on the uh, events today, uh, the WTO is a, a unique place uh, to foster multilateralism, uh, multimodal and multi-stakeholder di dialogue uh, on international supply chains that keep uh, you know, help us uh, make this more more resilient. So, uh, with that, thank you so much. Great, thank you very much. Well, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you for all your perspectives. Glad to see we have not just problems but um, but solutions. And I look forward to all the supply chain problems being ironed out in the next few weeks or so with all this information. Thank you so much. Um, uh, and with that, let me hand on to the uh, the next panel. Um, on unlocking solutions to uh, building resilient and inclusive supply chains, and it will be chaired by Adva Saudinger from DevEx. So let me hand over. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Alan. Uh, my name is Adva Saldinger. I'm a senior reporter at DevEx, and it's um, my pleasure to be with all of you today. And I'm really looking forward to um, our conversation where we're going to try to talk about some of the solutions or what can be done to try to 
unlock solutions and, and really build more resilient and inclusive supply chains. We've heard about the challenges that are before us, um, but I've got a great set of panelists who are going to help walk us through some of the things that might be done to address the challenges we're facing today. I'd like to introduce them. We'll have Luz Maria de la Mora Sanchez, who's the Undersecretary for Foreign Trade at Mexico's Secretariat of Economy. Young Tai Kim, the Secretary General of the International Transport Forum. Penny Nas, who's the UPS President for International Public Affairs and Sustainability. We'll have Ryan Peterson, who's the CEO of Flexport. And Gita Tharmaran, Tharmaratnam, Apologies, Gita, <laughs> um, who is the CEO and founding partner at Equalitas Capital Partners. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, and I, I will also try to keep us moving at pace because we, um, we have a limited period of time and a lot of things that we want to discuss. Um, so Luz Maria, I want, to, I want to go to you first. It, as we've seen, you know, disruptions accelerate the reconfiguration of supply chains. What is Mexico doing today to try to, you know, re to, you know, reconfigure and build resilient and inclusive supply chains? What kind of work are you undertaking, especially with your main trading partners to make this happen? Thank you, Eva. Thank you very much for having me and the Secretary of Economy of Mexico in this uh, panel. I want to thank Dr. Negosi Okonjo-Iwala for organizing this very timely forum. And I'm sure this will give private and public stakeholders some food for thought on ways to attain resilient global supply chains. Before getting into what Mexico is doing to meet this goal, I would like to begin by addressing some of the lessons that we learned from COVID-19, which I think will serve as a guide for managing supply chain resilience in the future, um, in future crisis. Um, let me just elaborate on three. The first is we'll learn the relevance of multilateral collaboration to counteract um, shortages, disruptions, but mainly uncertainty. The second is that we had to be resourceful and we had to innovate. We expanded foreign trade, for example, to e-commerce, which has been instrumental in the survival and growth of businesses. And we learned the importance of efficiently managing stock and delivery logistics, and also of having appropriate infrastructure for the successful operation of e-commerce, for example. And the third one has to be with inclusiveness. The impact of this pandemic was huge for, and is still here, and it has affected all across the board. But there are some who have been more affected than the rest. So we had to be inclusive and had to focus on incorporating vulnerable players into global value chains. So with this in mind, uh, I want to share with you that uh, we are part of the international architecture. and We're working to be responsible citizens in WTO, G20, OECD, APEC, Pacific Alliance, and with our partners uh, by growing our network of free trade agreements and bilateral investment treaties. With respect to innovation, we have been conducting a national strategy to strengthen Mexico's capacity for supply chain integration by identifying key players and industrial sectors where Mexico can increase its participation by integrating into global value chains and diversifying our international suppliers. To do so, we're currently working with national stakeholders uh, linked to global supply chains and promoting coordination among government agencies, academia, and foreign trade partners. I want to share with you that with the US, we're working on supply chain resilience as part of the Mexico-United States high-level economic dialogue. We have identified critical sectors where our countries are exploring opportunities to complement our respective supply chain needs. And we assess uh, prospects for increased competitiveness, attract investment, and also reduce vulnerabilities. We have created a working group on supply chains, which currently focuses on strengthening the semiconductors industry. And this uh, involves creating the right connections, but also the right business environment for business to flourish. We have also established a bilateral initiative on workforce development, and we are working on trade facilitation and border infrastructure initiatives to promote investment opportunities in our economies. We want a more inclusive trade, and for that matter, we have used technology to ensure that we have um, we we have we offer the kind of capacity building that our companies require. We have established, for example. Um, 
digital, through digital means, we have established uh, Export IMX, which is a way of linking women-owned micro, small and medium-sized companies um, to business opportunities through digital means. And we have also created open data platforms such as Export MX, Comercia MX, Data Mexico, and all sorts of things. So I, I just want to conclude by saying that the Mexican government and the Mexican private sector are working hand in hand to strengthen our supply chains. And we are convinced that this work will deliver a stronger, more inclusive, and more sustainable economy. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to go to you next. As an international, as an intergovernmental organization that covers transport, you have sort of a unique overarching position. And so I'm hoping that you can help us sort of understand what some of the biggest points of weaknesses are in our global transportation networks. And tell us a little bit about what efforts to strengthen them have worked in the past. So what can we learn from those past experience to really, you know, try to address the challenges that we're seeing today? Thank, thank you very much. Uh... Good afternoon. In, in fact, the past two years have shown uh, that our global supply chains are very vulnerable and especially vulnerable to external shocks like pandemics and uh, war. And but some vulnerabilities are the result of internal factors as well. And to give you an example from road transport and the closing of borders during the initial phase of the pandemic initially hampered international road freight. And there are not so much uh, the industry could do about that. But the pandemic also exacerbated the driver shortage and it turned out the industry had not done enough to attract young people as professional drivers. So let me now focus on maritime shipping a bit, which transport 90% of the global freight. And at the beginning of 2020, two thirds of ships arrived in port on schedule, but two years later, two thirds of the ships are late. The average delay of container ships is now around seven days. The turnaround time for ships in port in China and the US has doubled since 2020. The many countries have lost their direct connections because operators reconfigured their network, particularly in Latin America, Europe, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Then there is also the cost side. Spot rates in container shipping are around six times higher than two years ago. This creates definitely major challenges for importers and exporters. Uh, the steep rise in ocean transport cost translates into higher prices of consumer goods that fuel inflation. They can also erode the profitability of importing or exporting companies that cannot pass on increased transport costs. The unpredictability of cargo arrival times also undermines just-in-time production. Generally, the difficulties in securing cargo space have created much uncertainty. If you look at what factors lie behind this, I can see three explanations. First, the interconnectedness of global transport chains. The increased demand in North America for consumer goods from Asia has prompted operations to shift container ship capacity to the Trans-Pacific routes. The shift has driven up the price of ocean transport and caused ship delays in other parts of the world. Although demand container capacity there has not changed much. In other words, a local supply chain issue has become a global one. A second factor is the state of competition in container shipping. As the pandemic hit, container freight demand collapsed, yet freight rate didn't fall. What happened was a coordinated withdrawal of cargo carrying capacity allegedly to adjust to de decreasing demand. But freight rates rose again as early as June 2020. So there are indicators that prompt the question of whether the container shipping market is sufficiently competitive. A third factor is the transport network have become highly consolidated and integrated. And vertical integration in the shipping sector is accelerating. The shipping companies, are increasingly investing in marine and inland terminals, in road haulages, in the freight forwarding and logistics business more broadly. They now offer door-to-door -door services, but they can create conflicting interest. They become competitors of the pure logistics companies who are at the same time their customers. They have an incentive to use their own terminals, even where clients would be better served with a different solution. One of the effects is that hub ports benefit 
while secondary ports are left behind, reducing global connectivity. So how can you fix these specific global supply chain woes? The governments have focused mainly on resolving port in hinterland bottlenecks and the transparency of freight rates. Competition authorities have also carried out a few investigations into containerized maritime transport. These are all worthy initiatives, but a strategic review of economic regulation of the global inner sector may be in order. It also warrants discussion whether we need a global governance architecture for liner shipping markets, and it could look like. The WTO doesn't deal with shipping, but uh, its framework offers inspiration for such a debate. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Penny, I wanna to go to you next. We have heard already about the sort of greater challenges that SMEs are facing um, as we're seeing you know, disruption in supply chains. And so I wanted to ask you, what kind of supply chain management solutions can really improve market access? And how are you advising customers, both in the short and long-term, especially those SMEs, um, about what they need to do to adjust to these shifts. Thank you so much. And thanks to all my co-panelists for um, for this great discussion today. I think building on some of the things we heard in the earlier panel, as well as from our opening speakers, I'm gonna stick to kind of four key points. Um, first off is when we're talking to small and medium-sized exporters, um, in particular, what we're hearing is still an enthusiasm for international trade and, in a, and a desire to expand their markets. So whatever has happened in the past two years, what we're seeing is still a thirst for people to expand their business and to export. And so with that, I just want to kind of start by saying global trade remains um, remarkably resilient in terms of the SMEs and in terms of how they see their opportunities. The second thing I would speak to is end-to-end -end visibility. So one of the things that we're seeing and, and working with our SMEs on is how to improve their end-to-end -end visibility of their supply chains, as well as when they're um, sending things to customers. So that is an ecosystem that we are issue that we are working with, with lots of small companies on and trying to help them to improve and gain that visibility as well as to provide it to their own customers. A third point I'd like to pick up on is the trade facilitation agreement. So for a lot of the customers and the SMEs we work with, the, it's the crossing the border process that's very complicated for them. And so I just want to applaud the, the WTO and the work that's gone on with the trade facilitation agreement, as well as some of the advances that have taken place during COVID, whether it be digitalization, whether it be moving away from paper, whether it be accepting electronic signatures. Some of those are gains that we really need to try to, to take and to capture because they've provided a tremendous opportunities for small and medium sized companies to, to grow and to move their products in a way that is less, has less friction than it has had in the past. And the last point I would want to make, and I want to follow up on um, De La Mora's point from earlier, we've done a lot of work, particularly in Mexico with the Mexican government around training and inclusive trade. And so we've really focused on meeting some of these small and medium sized companies where they are, and then helping them not only with the trade process, but also with digital skills. Because a lot of small and medium sized companies coming into COVID and, and even through COVID, it, it's really starting with the fundamentals of digital and how to go online, how to, how to look at and use the digital tools that are available today to improve their process and procedures. And we've seen some tremendous success um, with, with several of the customers that we've worked with, but it's really something that governments and companies and multilateral organizations need to work together and help advance in order to make sure that these small and medium sized um, enterprises have uh, the tools and the skills they need to be a success. So those would be kind of the main points I'd like to start with where I think we can really make and, and help provide some solutions to small and medium sized exporters. Thank you. Great, thanks Penny. And, and you know, you talked about sort of some of these advances coming up during COVID and, and Ryan, I wanna turn to you next and ask you how you think we can turn crises like the COVID pandemic 
In turn, opportunity to really identify some of those structural weaknesses in, in supply chains and then use the opportunity of this crisis, if, if we want to sort of put it that way, to make trade more efficient and integrated. Sure. Hey, everybody. I'm Ryan Peterson. I'm the founder and CEO of Flexport. We're a technology platform for global logistics. So we help businesses ship cargo all over the world and, and get them better visibility, better control, uh, hopefully lower costs and, and sort of manage that whole end-to-end -end process, which is very complicated, as some of our panelists have alluded to. Um, and COVID has made it a lot more challenging. I think as much as anything, it's the response to COVID, response to the disease, both from a policy standpoint and culturally, how people have responded. So people have been buying way more goods than services, and we've seen that our infrastructure just can't keep up. And infrastructure is kind of a vague term. What I mean for that, is, what I mean by that is the number of ships in the world, the throughput of our ports, the chassis, the availability of trucks and chassis, and, and even the people involved are a big part of that. Um, clearing borders and, and uh, driving trucks and managing it all the flow end to end. Um, we just haven't been able to keep up. At twenty, it was about a twenty percent surge in the United States in container imports uh, as people shifted from like buying services at restaurants and hotels, travel onto uh, goods, and so that has really highlighted some of the big problems and those problems existed whether or not you knew about them and so in that from that standpoint maybe there is a silver lining here is that we can now start to address things like port capacity throughput and um, the need to invest in technology is probably more clear than ever at every stage of this chain um, and what can that technology do so you know the things like self-driving trucks get a lot of attention in the media and hype and they're probably an important aspect here but it's a really hard problem um, because you're driving on the road with other human beings and that's you know i don't know why we would start there um when there are opportunities that are much simpler uh, we've got a couple of, in the united states a couple of ports that are reasonably automated um two terminals in la and long beach are the only ones in the united states um china singapore rotterdam are, are leaders in this area we're way behind and I hope that that uh, fosters some discussion. We've got this massive infrastructure bill of $1.2 trillion being spent. Um, it'd be great to see some of that go into things like the ports, if we can upgrade and, and allow for the throughput. Because right now, it seems to me that the solution for bringing things back to normalcy, to supply chains flowing more smoothly, port operations returning to normal, the solution that I'm seeing and that is most likely to play out is the destruction of demand. Is, is people stopping to buy containers because the price is so high, stopping to buy goods because inflation is so high. Um, well, that's not really the solution that we're looking for uh, as an industry and as a civilization. I mean, we, the world runs off of trade. We need, we, it's, the, it's the circulatory system of the world economy. And if we suddenly say, oh, you know, we, we're gonna stop, we're gonna slow down the amount of trade in order to make the supply chain run smoother, that seems like the wrong approach. Um, so things like terminal automation, data um, is a key in all of this, that every single provider in the chain kind of optimizes their own local operations. And you see a lot of decisions get made that are good for that one participant, but not taking into account the stakeholders up and down the chain. Um, and stakeholders, again, another vague term, what I'm talking about is if a ship is late, then how do the truckers get notified that we need to rebook all these trucks? And if, if we can know about that weeks in advance, we can signal that and we can queue up the drivers to arrive at the right time for the right, to grab the right container. Or um, even more tactically, right now at a port, at least in the United States, a truck driver shows up looking for a specific container. They need to find that one container number, which means the port has to bring that container number to the front to make it available for that driver. That means you need an appointment slot. But appointment slots are very hard to hit if there's traffic. And so in the port of LA for the last six months or so, truck drivers are only arriving for on time for 50% of their appointments. 50% of the appointments are going to waste. Well, this is relatively simple solution with technology that would allow that driver to just take the first available container and then the mobile app can tell them where to take it instead of going for a specific container. I think you could dramatically improve throughput at these ports without just through that simple data sharing without uh, without needing massive robotics and investment and stuff. So that's an example where data and technology can just drive huge leverage in a system. Uh, I mean, it shouldn't be very controversial, but it's not easy to implement these types of things. Well, thank you.
Thanks, Ryan. I think that's definitely some some food for thought that it's not always the most complicated or most sort of technical technologically advanced solution, but sometimes it's the easier thing <laughs> that we can look to to solve some of these challenges. Gita, I wanted to go to you next. Um, we have definitely heard so far about some challenges in um, financing and in you know, finding the capital necessary to ensure that flows are going for, you know, big businesses and SMEs alike to be able to access the trade finance that they need. And so I wanted to ask you sort of where and how you think capital um, can or should be deployed to both improve supply chain efficiency, but also to have a real ESG um, impact and sort of what, what partnerships do we need to make that happen? Thank you, Eva, and, and thank you to the WTO and to the uh, Director General uh, for, for being here. Um, the perspective I'm going to start with is really one from a private equity perspective and from a private capital perspective. Um, and uh, I wanted to say that ahead of time because I think the, there are two aspects to this, one of which is the supply of capital um, and the other of which is the demand for capital. Um, on the supply side, uh, the development finance institutions uh, remain critical to be able to unlock this. And ESG has been quite central to these very development finance institutions, including the regional ones like the African Development Bank, in terms of how capital is deployed and how it is managed. So when we think about the um, what is needed here, there, there are a few things that I would bring to, to mind. The first of which is uh, measurement matters. You need to really reflect the net impact on emissions, which are generated all the way through the supply chain. And uh, we have had ESG uh, being highlighted over two decades ago, actually by the UN. And now it is over a $35 trillion industry. Um, and given that almost one third of US assets under management are considered ESG uh, using our ESG criteria, it is a um, essential time for us to ensure that supply chain financing is being conducted in the right way. And the measurement is the first issue that I bring up because it creates a, a sense of accountability. Uh, my concern is otherwise there is going to be a derailment of the uh, su sustainable financing of businesses in the supply chain space if we are not measuring well uh, and uh, if that is not something that companies are, are looking at from a net perspective. So all the way through. Um, the second thing as well is there's no unified reporting standard. So in the absence of that being developed, it is important that businesses are extra um, uh, extra transparent with what it is that they are doing. Otherwise, uh, there is a, a potential, again, derailment effect uh, if it is considered that these businesses which are getting financing uh, are, are not uh, authentic or there's greenwashing going on. And this affects the investment community as well because the capital that is coming, and now we're talking about the supply side, the capital that's coming on that side needs to ensure that um, the visibility around what it is that they're looking at in terms of identifying opportunities is also sustained. Uh, the third point that I would raise is this pandemic has really shown us the blind spots in information related to the supply lines. We have seen such disruption and what we have also seen is a uh, a rapid escalation and scale up of financing of supply chains within countries, within regions. And this has been uh, a game changer. So looking at this, it is really critical that when we look at uh, ESG efficiency and ESG impact within the, the local and, and regional financing of businesses, we're not, we're, we're understanding supply chain financing to go well beyond logistics. It is actually in, built within every industry because without that, nothing moves. Services don't move and, and products don't move. Uh, and so the governance of this is a good place within which to, um, to, to actually um, embed the management of the ESG imperative. So what I mean by that is boards in private companies. And then on the investor side, what you have is a requirement for the investment committees of uh, investors who are investing in these businesses to take seriously how ESG is being implemented across the supply chain, looking well beyond purely logistics businesses. Um, and I'll go into some examples at a later point from a healthcare perspective and from an agriculture perspective. Great, thank you. And I, I know there's uh, there's a whole lot of people out there across a number of industries who would really like to see some global standards to help guide 
financing on that, though we did see a little bit of movement on disclosure today from the US SEC, which is now going to require climate disclosure at companies that happened this morning. Um, and we're, we're going to um, go to each of our panelists again. But in as we do that, I wanted to also welcome uh, Usha Chani Dwarka Kanabadi, who is the an ambassador and the WTO incoming chair for the Committee on Trade and Development, who is going to give us some uh, sort of closing takeaways um, in a few minutes. But I wanted to welcome you to this part of the discussion. And um, while I certainly have questions for each of you, if there's something that one of your co-panelists says that sort of sparks something, feel free to sort of jump in or let me know. And, and um, we can try to have a little bit of back and forth as well. Um, I, Liz Maria, let's start with you. And, you know, I, I'm curious what sort of policies or initiatives or processes the government has put in place or, um, you know, is thinking about to make supply chains work more smoothly and what sort of impact those have had? Are there lessons that countries can learn from um, how Mexico has done this to sort of Im improve supply chain optimization? Sure. Thank you, Adna. Well, um, one of the reasons we have this supply chain disruption is precisely the pandemic. So we have pursued a very intense vaccination campaign. 60% of the adult population in Mexico has already received the full vaccination scheme to ensure immunity. So having said that, let me move to trade, to the trade area. Uh, trade facilitation has already been mentioned, but we have paid a lot of attention to this. The effective implementation of the WTO trade facilitation agreement has been key and crucial to facing this uh, supply chain disruption. We have implemented a single window among others and we have proven to be, uh, this has proven to be crucial to the resilience of supply chain. We have also launched Mexico's National Committee on Trade Facilitation in March, 2021. And we specifically included a site for private sector comments and feedback. And we have a direct engagement with the private sector because we need to be very close to understand where are the challenges of these uh, disruptions. Uh, with respect to near shoring, we have launched a one-stop shop called Invierte en Mexico or Invest in Mexico. This is a best practice that we got from recommendations in different international organizations, for example, the WTO negotiation on investment facilitation. This new site that was launched in December of last year offers all kinds of information for companies interested in establishing in Mexico and developing their projects in our countries. It identifies paperwork needed to, to start an investment and also offers a place where uh, investors can uh, get their questions answered and or solve problems arising from their operations. Um, let me show you uh, what we have done with the US and Canada. We have established a high level economic dialogue where supply chain resilience is a priority. In 2021, we created a working group for public officers from the Ministry of Economy and the US Department of Commerce devised an action plan to make sure that we reduce value chain vulnerabilities. In semiconductor production, we have identified that Mexico is ready to develop segments of the semiconductor value chain, for example, in design, testing, and advanced packaging. The latter currently concentrated in Asia. With Canada, which is our fifth largest trading partner, we will also be launching a high-level economic dialogue to address supply chain disruption, not only with Canada, but in all North America. With our Pacific Alliance partners, Chile, Colombia, and Peru, we have worked to strengthen our regional value chains by doing outreach through electronic means and also by creating the Pacific Alliance marketplace. This will be a digital marketplace that will open new and more opportunities for our small and medium-sized companies. And we have also moved to the acceptance of digital certificate of origins instead of requesting the traditional papers so that trade operations are not disrupted. And this year, under Mexico's presidency of the Pacific Alliance, we have launched an eight-session workshop for SMEs to learn how to take advantage of Pacific Alliance preferences and how we can build stronger value chains in the region. We also want to make sure that we have the kind of talent that value chains require. And this is the reason we're linking the program of students and graduates to needs of firms in Mexico. We're also working on ensuring access to finance, which we know it's key. This is why we're working with Mexico's National Development Bank to make sure SMEs have access to loans that will enable them to be part of supply chains. 
and we're also working um, on updating and our trade and investment framework. We are um, we have a, a network of 14 free trade agreements with 50 countries, and we are um, strengthening it with negotiations with Ecuador, the UK, and South Korea. So these are some of the the areas that we're working on in Mexico. Thank you. Thanks. You talked a lot about sort of collaboration both across governments with the private sector, and so Young, I'd like to um, to ask you you know, what you'd like to see from governments, organizations like the WTO and private sector companies in terms of how you think they can work together more effectively um, to sort of join the various links and transportation networks at the same time as, you know, another global challenge that's facing us is climate change, right? So at the same time as they're trying to accelerate decarbonization efforts, how can they work on improving transportation networks and what's needed between all the different sort of parties and players, all of whom are participating here and, and, and tuning in um, to sort of make that work more effectively. Thank you. Perhaps I will uh, share the ITF's experience with you. And as, as we all know, uh, transport is responsible for roughly a quarter of energy related CO2 emissions today. And, and also uh, transport is the only sector where still sees growing emissions. And freight, for example, accounts for 40% of transport CO2s. And ITF uh, projections show that uh, the freight activity which underpins global trade will continue to grow and so will emissions from freight. And in 2050, uh, freight CO2 emissions will be about one fifth higher if nothing drastic changes. And without decarbonizing freight transport and transport in general, the international community will not reach the climate targets of the Paris Agreement. A major challenge is that transport modes that make the exchange of goods possible today are the hardest to decarbonize. And decarbonizing urban transport is relatively straightforward. And the short range of electric vehicles does not matter so much. And shifting demand to sustainable modes like mass transit is feasible. But aviation and maritime transport and long distance trucking are hard to decarbonize. If aviation were the country, it would have been the sixth largest CO2 direct emitter behind Japan and ahead of Germany. And heavy duty road vehicles are, account for 73% of greenhouse gas emissions from freight transport. And shipping sector alone emits 3% of global energy related CO2 emissions. So how can we create a dynamic in which governments the private sector and multilateral organizations create real synergies to overcome this critical challenge. The ITF has created three common interest group uh, to drive progress in decarbonizing these hard to abate uh, transport modes. Because all, all, all the time, so many people talked about ambition, but now we hear more often from ambition to action. And ITF recently set up a DT implement project. And these groups are country led and they involve private sector stakeholders and they are facilitated by the ITF. So, so far 30, 31 countries are currently participating and their aim is to identify common priorities in research and innovation that will speed up the deployment and commercialization of zero and low carbon solutions. And such policy support and in international cross-sector cooperation is crucial for success. It helps to gauge which emission reduction technologies are the most suited for quick progress in these hard to decarbonize modes. And second example of how to confederate very different actors around the common cause to save the climate is the ITF's Transport Climate Action Directory, which is called TCAT. And the TCAT is an online database that contains close to 100 mitigation measures that government can use. And each measure provides rough estimation of CO2 reductions if governments are uses. And the tool was created to provide decision makers with a range of options that can deliver concrete decarbonizing outcomes for transport in their specific context. And TCAT was in fact launched in July, 2020, and it was endorsed by UNFCCC organizing COP uh, every year. And for this very practical project, we have brought together more than 70 partners, such as national government and international organizations and multilateral development bank and so on and so on. 
So this is a really good example of uh, working together for decarbonizing for decarbonizing transport. And Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC has called the TCAT Transport Climate Action Directory a milestone for integrated climate policy and a trailblazer for a broader cross-sector approach to combating climate change. I'm very proud of these two projects, which are part of the ITF's large-scale decarbonizing transport initiative. And I think uh, WTO is also a very important platform and a uh, platform connected to platform can for sure create a lot of synergies in the global community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Penny, I wanna to turn to you. You said you had some examples I think you, you might wanna share with us. And, and I'd, I'd like to sort of hear from you about uh, transparency and traceability in supply chains and how that can sort of facilitate SME and developing country participate in participation in, in trade. Um, I think we're seeing sort of greater demand around transparency and traceability. Um, digitizing those systems can help us get there. That can also be hard for some, you know, smaller SMEs for companies that are starting in, in developing countries. So tell us a little bit about what you think some of the challenges are right now around traceability in these digital systems, but what can be done to sort of build that up and really get more smaller players, more diversity in the countries that are participating in our global trade system? Yes, I think it's a great question. And it builds on, I think, the comments that were just made around climate change. So if you think about a lot of the things that are going on in the trade world today, um, there is a, a huge press to have a better understanding of your tier two and tier three suppliers. So you wanna know where they're located. Right now I'm dealing with a train strike in Canada, city shutdowns in China, weather in other parts of the world. And it, in the old days, you needed to know which country your suppliers were in, but it's become even more critical in some cases to know exactly which cities or regions they're in. Then it's important to understand, you know, what kind of practices they're 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 following. Are they are they following your climate change um, disclosure requirements? Are they ensuring that they're they're hiring and using proper labor practices and the practices that you as a company want to have? And I think that when you take all of these pressures into play, while there are certain standardization certification bodies that are out there. I think we're going to see more and more need for some kind of single set of standards uh, that may be developed by which um, suppliers can be certified. Because I know it's really, really tough when I'm talking to small and medium-sized companies to, for them to figure out how do I, what do I need to comply with? Which ISO standards do I need to have in place? What do I need to do in order to enter global value chains? And the more we can do to try to create processes and procedures that make it easier for, for small and medium-sized companies to be standardized, certified, whatever, that they are a good employer that's following proper procedures, that's doing X, Y, and Z, the easier it is to bring them in and incorporate them in some of these global value chains. And I think that's something that um, we're just gonna continue to see the pressure on companies. The SEC climate change disclosures were just mentioned, they just came out. There's a scope three component, which means that I, as a large filer, am going to have to make sure that I understand the climate change um, footprint of any outside service provider we have and, um, and do that in the next couple of years. And that's going to become an incredibly challenging um, uh, issue, but there's a huge opportunity for whether it be the WTO or others, the ITC, the ICC, others to come in and say, hey, here's a, here's a, here's a certification project by which these companies are being deemed, um, be, being deemed well uh, for your supply chains. And I think that that would be incredibly helpful for, for all. Um, the other thing I would just like to say is I think that digital remains, um, you know, remains a really important issue, and it remains an important issue also with governments. You know, the public and the private sector have to work together, and we've seen some incredible advances. But you know, government systems and the budget you need to do it um, is is a challenge. 
And uh, the more we can find easier solutions to some of the challenges that are out there that don't require a wholesale overhaul of government systems, the more agile and the faster we can run together moving forward to help our companies while also protecting our borders and working together. Thank you. Thanks, Penny. And, and I think this is the perfect time to go to Ryan, who's our, our tech expert on this, on this panel. And so I, I want to throw it to you and ask, you know, how, how can technology and automation sort of evolve in transport and logistics? Can it help solve some of these challenges? And, and where do we need further innovation? Where can we use sort of existing things? Where, where, can, where do we need to focus future innovation efforts? Certainly it's around data and how do you get the right data to the right parties? Um, you know, to execute a single transaction in the <coughs> container freight world or pallet, something that's too big for the UPS conveyor belt and it has to go through the freight network instead of on their parcel network, I think you have like incredible innovation, incredible because they control the system end to end they can own the IT backbone, they can build the technology, they can deliver that awesome customer experience where you like get the milestones in the mobile app and like it really works. <clears throat> Once you get to the things that are too big for the traditional parcel carrier networks, like literally too big, you can't pick the thing up, the driver won't fit in the back of the truck, won't go down the conveyor belt. Um, you end up in, a, in what we call freight forwarding where you have um, as many as 18 companies on a single transaction having to play some role. On one transaction, if you're shipping a pallet of goods from the middle of, call it Vietnam, to the middle of the United States, you've got as many, that many companies involved. Um, and so getting them each the data that they need, getting data from them about what they're doing. Now, some of these are asset owners, so trucking companies, ocean carriers or airlines, warehouses. Uh, many of them are, are local coordinating functions, brokers <coughs> who know the truckers and connect them, customs agents that know the regulations that can help uh, with compliance. There's a bank, there's an insurance company, right? It's a lot of different moving pieces. And traditionally, I, this is why I often joke, we call our industry freight forwarding. I often say it should be called freight email forwarding because you're sort of just connecting these parties together by email. And, and, and the potential for data sharing, one is to eliminate mistakes, improve compliance, improve visibility, improve control. Um, but two is, is really take things to the next level in terms of how we do routing, how we optimize use of the assets, uh, things that people would never even be good at. Um, that, you know, there's a classic problem in computer science called the traveling salesman, which is choosing the optimal route that someone should take if they want it. How can they hit five different points uh, in the fastest way? And, it, and it's a notoriously difficult problem in computer science. Um, and machine learning paves the way if you can feed the machines enough data that they can start to make these routing decisions, loading decisions, what should go into a plane or a container to optimize for that asset. Um, I think right now we, we look at all the containers we ship. Um, we're shipping about 400,000 containers a year on our platform. And we, because we use machine learning to digitize the packing list, which tells you just by looking at the geometry of the boxes, how full the container is. Um, now, this is something you, humans can do it, you know, on an Excel file, but it would just take too long and cost too much. Whereas um, a machine, you just feed it and it costs nothing. Um, what we're seeing is that on average across those 400,000 containers, they're only 70% full. Um, so clearly we can get better usage out of our assets. We, it's much easier to put 30% or 25%, you know, more stuff in a container than it is to ship 25% more containers through a port. Uh, much simpler to reduce carbon emissions that way than to try to improve the internal combustion engine in, in, in terms of emissions. Um, so I think th you're gonna see that these types of things really help the asset owners. They help the importers and exporters save money on shipping less things. Uh, and that, that's just one example of like, let's put more stuff in there. Another, another great example we see right now is the port of Long Beach has delays of like three weeks to move cargo through the port right now. The ships are waiting offshore for three weeks before they can unload. The port of Oakland, which is one day sailing to the north, has a five day delay. And yet people continue to ship their stuff to Long Beach. 
And these are things where data, you know, even if you, a human can make that decision, but a machine would never make that decision. It would just look route right around it and say, hey, wait, there's a much faster way. Um, so I think you'll see that humans are, are, are really, really good at some things, but they're not very good at other things. And more and more as you give the data to the machines and you give them context, and by the way, you teach them what humans have done in the past on the face with the same decision, the machine learning algorithms will start to really optimize things. So that's, I think, going to be a 10-year trend that we're going to see have a massive, massive impact. Um, and, and it's all about getting data to and from the right parties in the, in, the, um, in the stack, in the chain, so that those machines can actually make the decisions. And, and, you know, so we need, we need innovation in the data space to make things work more efficiently. Do we need innovation in financial products as well? Um, particularly as we look at ensuring that SMEs and those in developing countries can participate in these global supply chains? What sort of innovations do we need on the finance side um, to address that piece of the challenge? I mean, so I think, I uh, oh, I'd love to go ahead and hear from somebody else too. I, I think in general, um, financing businesses is, is a great business. People make a lot of money doing this. Uh, and so, and one of the interesting facts of but banks don't really like to provide collateral to companies who are shipping products because the, under ancient maritime law, the logistics provider has first lien on those goods, um, which is a great opportunity. You know, UPS has built UPS Capital, which is a great business for them. Flexport has a, a similar product helping companies that are uh, to, because we have the first lien. So if the company goes bankrupt, we have that merchandise. And so it's a really um, a very innovative way to secure, provide security to the lenders which allows these transactions to be done at lower interest rates and scales trade finance. So I think you're gonna see more and more companies uh, fill that gap. Sorry, go ahead. Someone else was trying to speak as well. Keith? No worries, um, Ryan. Uh, I think on the financing side, if we talk about innovation, I think we, you know, sometimes it's about just recognizing what has already happened. Uh, FinTech has taken off in a massive way and there are two advantages to that. One of which is it's allowed for democratization of how capital is being used uh, to finance everything all the way down to individual consumers. The other part of this is what it means in terms of attracting investors who are interested in being part of that growth. So this again is one of those inter sections where it can get very, very interesting as we think about building more resilience into the, the economies that we are trying to strengthen uh, across the world. And I'd like to double click down into Africa as an example. So in 2021, there was 4.9 billion in total estimated funding that went into the private sector, 4.9 billion. 62% of that went into fintech. Only 7% of that went into logistics. So when we come back to how can you actually look at innovations in terms of financing, that's the thing I'm still most excited about, which is can you embed requirements into uh, sustainable financing and make that mainstream? Um, and what does this mean in terms of, of fintech? Um, a second aspect of this for me is if you look at this from a private equity perspective, not just on the venture side, but with uh, larger businesses as well. Uh, between 2015 and, and 2020, there was about almost uh, $20 billion that was raised uh, by African private equity. And this capital has been deployed. And again, the bulk of that has really gone into a combination. It's been fairly uh, diversified with the top four sectors being consumer direct, uh, discretionary, consumer staples, industrials, and financials. But between those, they are at over 50% of the financing. So for me, when I, when I look at the, the potential for innovation here, there's innovation on the level of, uh, uh, of, of investors, there's innovation on the level of the companies and what you're acquiring of the companies in providing the financing. Um, and then the third part of this is how do you ensure more uh, inclusion and equity all the way through from the employees who are in these businesses to the consumers who are being served. Um, and Ryan talked about increasing efficiency. And I think there is an element of this, which is definitely there here too, in terms of how can you increase efficiency to reduce costs whilst keeping an eye on the, on the quality of what is being provided. Um, and I'd like to use a specific example. One of the investments I made was in an uh, investment in Nigeria called Omnibus. And this is a, a business which has been looking at addressing informal trade, because in Africa currently right now, the retail trade around inform, uh, informal businesses is massive. Um, and the nominal GDP contribution stands at about $2.6 trillion. 
and 80% of the jobs are actually in this space. Um, and by the way, 76% of these retail businesses are run by women. So if you want to look at how you're going to be able to um, have an impact there, this is a space that you want to. So this is uh, a business that is really looking at those individual uh, retailers um, who are mostly traveling to wholesale markets to buy goods. Um, they have to close down their shops. There's a loss of business, loss of, of customers and increasing efficiency there because there's a broken supply chain when it comes to traditional trade. Um, and here we're not talking about the largest businesses, we're talking about the smallest ones, but the ones which are providing the uh, essential goods and services, essential goods rather, in places that often are not reached by, by large businesses. And looking at this here in terms of the sub-distributors, there's an opportunity, right, where you're looking at microstock uh, management, uh, crowdsourcing logistics, but, you know, they have had to come with a financing solution as well, because you are not able to handle just solving one piece of the puzzle if you're not able to come with a solution around finance thing it actually, uh, it, it, it does not allow for an integrated set of solutions. So um, for me, Adva, what I'm, I'm most excited about is still the ability to use capital for development, but ensuring that you are more inclusive in the way that is being done. Great. Thank you. All right. I now have uh, the honor of turning things over to Usha to sort of give us some key takeaways from this panel. Um, and, and just wanted to ask you how you think they might inform WTO's work going forward, especially around climate resilience and aid for trade investment. So I'll give it over to you for, for a few minutes as we close out this panel. Thank you, Adva. It's been fascinating listening to everybody. And I'll just be as brief as possible. To me, my mind, essentially, there, there are the three takeaways. One relates to a question raised by Alan in the previous panel about whether what we are seeing are permanent uh, effects because of shocks in the system. I don't see them as shocks in the system. I think what we are facing today is a new normal. So, you know, you might talk about pandemic is one. Climate change, everybody's mentioned climate change from a finance perspective and otherwise. I take one concrete example. You look at the Indian Ocean. From January to March now, you've had five cyclones, five cyclonic formations. If your delivery gets rescheduled because of one cyclone, imagine five. Four of those cyclones have hit Madagascar. The Atlantic is gearing up for a very intense um, tropical cyclone storm period. So we are in for more disruption. Then of course you have the unexpected events, the few shocks, Tonga, volcanic eruption, and then you've had Ukraine war. The Ukraine war with Russia, you're already looking at the first impact on wheat. You're looking at 25 African countries who import more than 30% of their wheat from these countries. So imagine the double effect the effect of the price of wheat going up, and of course the effect of the freight. Now, what does this bring you to? To me, what we are not seeing is that this is not having the same impact on all countries. The disruption is affecting countries unevenly, and this is where we need to be able to distill things and to look at things more, more in greater detail. For example, if you look at the analysis by UNCTAD recently done, that was a few days ago, what do you see? The impact, of higher container freight rates on consumer prices, when it is at 1.5% for the rest of the world, it is at 2.2% for least developed countries, and it is at 7.5% for small island developing states. So what do you do for them that's special and makes it different there? I mean, I have to talk about as the incoming head of the CTD, but if I was an island as Mauritius, have you ever wondered how a country gets its supplies? when you're this size and you have 1 million people and you need to import your things, whether you're on the way to something. So that is a discussion in itself that you need to have. It was fascinating listening to digitalization. How many parts of Africa can boast that? I was so happy listening to Luz Maria thinking, this is the woman we need to bring back to Africa and to help us get those digital certificates. You know, we need her. But I'll tell you what we can do. I think uh, we're going to have the aid for trade uh, discussion this year and the global review. And I think we need to take some of these takeaways there and to see how during in, in the context of aid for trade, in the context of the support that is provided, whether we can look at supply chain infrastructure, whether we can look at digitalization or any other elements. It's not the discussion that we have here. I think that CTD will look at, but I want to add this. You were asking all the time what WTO is doing. Well, let me tell you this. WTO, by bringing together all these people, is already doing something fantastic. We, as countries who are suffering from freight, simply asked for a webinar. Annabel turned it into a big forum with Dr. Ngozi, getting everybody from ministers, CEOs, operators, you know, what have you. You've had multiple conversations today. 
And along all panels, you've had different things, different people asking for everything. Penny asking for something which is there that we can't reach. We can't even imagine reaching there. We are still at that level. So we need to distill the information. And I think what WTO did, what was extremely important today, was in this talk is to see, oh, by the way, ITC is listening to us. Maybe we've got International Chamber of Commerce. Maybe we need the World Bank and IMF as well. Maybe we need to distill this into the different programs across the world. And that includes something called TICAD, which is Japan, Africa, for example, or India, Africa, China, Africa. TICAD gives a lot of money for com communication infrastructure within the African region. But do you ever wonder what it does for small island states? We've gone to the Japanese and asked them for a ship. We've asked because how do we communicate between Madagascar, Seychelles, Comoros, etc. You're talking there and we are here. So this is the communication and the conversation we still need to have and we'll distill it and we'll get there. But thank you for giving me a chance to intervene. Thank you, Adba. Wonderful. Thank you. And it's now my pleasure to turn things over, I think, to Annabelle Gonzalez for the closing. Thank you so much to all of our panelists um, for, for a great discussion today. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, this has been a fantastic discussion. Uh, and I would like to thank our distinguished speakers for their insightful perspectives and our moderators for their uh, able managing of our partners. So very quickly, I see three common threads in our discussion today. I mean, so many, so many ideas that it's really difficult to, uh, uh, to, to, to sort of bring them to three, uh, but I'll try. Uh, first, supply chains have been very resilient, but they are under growing strain from successive COVID disruptions, the surge in demand for consumer goods, and now the terrible conflict in Ukraine. We don't know what the next shock will be, but it's clear, I think, from today's conversation that we need to equip uh, our supply chains to deal better with growing threats and rising uncertainty. Second, making supply chains more resilient is not about trading less. It is about trading more and better. One critical uh, lesson from history is that when shock hits, a uh, trade is a source of uh, strength, not weakness. Uh, turning our backs to three decades of trade integration will further marginalize those who have borne the brunt of supply chain uh, impacts, small businesses, LDCs, landlocked developing countries, and small and vulnerable economies. So we cannot allow this to happen. And third, we need to respond with bold and coordinated actions, not piecemeal tinkering. Supply chain disruptions affect the lives and livelihoods of people everywhere. And they call for solutions that cut across players, public and private, as we have heard repeatedly today, across sectors and across regions. The WTO is in a unique position to bring all players together around practical, common sense approaches from deepening trade facilitation and accelerating automation and digitalization to monitoring trends in transport and logistics services and greening supply chains. You will hear more from us on what we plan on doing for the WTO to help address some of the supply chain bottlenecks that private sector is confronting and more broadly to keep supply chains moving. I'm sorry to inform you that Her Excellency Betty Maina, who is the cabinet secretary of Kenya's Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development, is unfortunately not able to stay with us to share her closing remarks. We are nevertheless very grateful uh, to Betty uh, for her uh, willingness uh, to participate in this uh, forum. And with that, let me turn it now to my colleague, uh, Jean-Marie Pogam, uh, for closing the event. Uh, Jean-Marie, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Annabelle, and thank you everyone for your, your participation. Um, I, I'll try to, 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 to complete your takeaway, Annabelle, which was excellent, and thank you for it, uh, by two or three uh, remarks. The first one is that I think all our discussions today have illustrated the intimate link that exists between the global trading system and global supply chains. No supply chain can properly operate without a global system of previsible and facilitating trading rules as the one the WTO operates. But of course, these rules uh, can do nothing for trade if supply chains are being physically interrupted. This is why for, for, from the outbreak of the COVID pandemic to, to the internal 
international situation today, we have been trying to understand the nature and likely duration of disruptions and bottleneck and trying to understand is, uh, I'm quoting the word of the ambassador, this could be a new normal. Uh, all of members have been incredibly concerned. Several of them have been already significantly impacted as we heard today, um, especially developing countries and inside them uh, SMEs, which are suffering most uh, and risk being locked out of trading networks. Today, uh, our discussion clearly showed that we remain on the hook. We, we have learned that supply chain blockages and bottlenecks will likely persist in 2022 and perhaps longer. In the short term, supply chain disruption directly built up into inflationary pressures. In the middle term, major uncertainties, including geopolitical, continue to cloud the prospect of a bottleneck easing. And in the longer run, it was said structural challenges, such as the modernization of infrastructure, digitalization, and decarbonization of supply chains will have to be successfully addressed. All the constituents of the world trading system have to take their share of the response, private sector, government, regulating agencies, and international organization. But at the end of the day, as our director general often says, trade is about people. And we would have uh, gladly welcomed Sharon Burrow, uh, head of the International Trade Confederation, who had to leave us, she was with, uh, with us, but asked me to convey her key message, uh, which I'll do right away. Uh, what, what Sharon wanted me to say is that the integration of labor, decent work, technology, and sustainability are vital to this discussion on value chains. From that on, I propose you to bring that event to a close. Uh, today was our first global supply chain forum. I trust that it may not be the last time that the WTO convene an event, meant, uh, an event and actors together about that. Uh, I want in my turn to warmly thank our speakers, moderators, partner organizations, WTO members, of course, and the wonderful WTO secretariat team, including people in the room with me now, uh, which has made this forum uh, possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Violeta and Karsten in particular. Have a nice evening.